This audiobook sampler is by Dr. Jim Richards, first published in 1990. The Gospel of Peace. Dedication. This book is dedicated to Bobby C. Good, my uncle. Thank you for being a role model, a friend, an example, and the only real father that I ever knew. Because you believed in me, I was able to believe in myself and come out of what would have been a disastrous lifestyle. In you, I saw high standards without rejection. You helped me to see God as Father. Impact International School of Ministry is raising up leaders that are able to meet the needs of this generation. The 21st century church is out of touch with the real needs of society. We have become a subculture that speaks a language no one understands. Our methods are outdated and ineffective. We are answering the questions that no one is asking, while ignoring and minimising the ones that are being asked. We have become like the religious community of Jesus' day. We cling to our traditions and make the word of God to no effect. More than once I have looked at ultra-religious people and applied this verse to them. But the truth is, any method I cling to that is no longer effective has become my tradition. Tradition comes from the things that were good, things that worked at one time. The church is like the children of Israel who didn't want to worship in the temple because they still clung to the tabernacle. That was good, but its time had passed. God's life, presence and power was no longer there. It was time to move on. Several major sources tell us that the majority of church growth in America is actually Christians changing churches. We are not really growing. The church has become a marketing agency that competes for those who know Jesus while abandoning those who do not know him. Impact School of Ministry will prepare you to reach this generation. Our commitment to the Word of God is absolute. Our commitment to methodology is as varied as the needs that exist. We are in touch with the world and we are on the cutting edge of what works. If you're more interested in reaching the world than following the crowd, this may be the training program for you. Impact School of Ministry has a residence program or an external program through which degrees can be earned. Call today for information. Chapter 1. Experiencing the Peace of God Hundreds of times in the Old Covenant, God tells man not to fear. When Jesus appeared to his disciples after his crucifixion, he said, Fear not. There should be no fear of God in the heart of a believer. There should only be a deep and powerful realisation of being loved and accepted by God the Father, the creator of the universe. When fear is in a person's heart towards God, it is clear that the person in question does not really believe that God loves him with a perfect love. If there is fear, it is because the person is afraid of what God will do to them. He is unafraid he will be hurt or rejected by God. 1 John 4.18 is best expressed in the Living Bible. We need have no fear of someone who loves us perfectly. His perfect love for us eliminates all dread of what he might do to us. If we are afraid, it is for fear of what he might do to us and shows that we are not fully convinced that he really loves us. An earmark of the Christian who believes what Jesus did through his death, burial and resurrection should be a life of confident acceptance that is permeated with peace. There should be no torment. There should be no nagging sense of guilt or rejection. There should only be peace. The earmark of a Christian who believes what Jesus did through his death, burial and resurrection should be a life of confident acceptance that is permeated with peace. There should be no torment. 
There should be no nagging sense of guilt or rejection. There should only be peace. Every religion in the world offers peace to man. Christianity is the only one, however, that delivers. For we are not a people who are attempting to achieve a state or status which will give us peace. We are a people who have been made right with God through the finished work of one man, Christ Jesus. And because of his finished work, we have been granted peace with God. Because every Christian does not know or believe this wonderful reality, not every Christian lives in a continual sense or state of peace. Quite the contrary, far too many Christians live in torment and turmoil, always fearful that things are not right between them and God. My involvement in ministering to people in mental wards has proven this time and time again. I have repeatedly seen the emotional, unstable and mentally tormented struggle with the fear of not being able to please God. The world is right when it says, religion will drive you crazy. Religion is man's attempt to find peace with God. Christianity, on the other hand, is man accepting peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. A great percentage of people in mental hospitals feel that they have done something that is beyond God's ability to forgive. They are awaiting judgment from an angry God. Many times they have no idea what they could have done. They just have a sense of fear and impending judgment. This is what the Bible calls condemnation, i.e. the expectation of damnation and judgment. In Christ we are free from condemnation. What is so sad is this portrait of fearful people also describes many of the faithful who sit in church every Sunday. Fear seems to be the motivating factor in the lives of many Christians. But where would these people get such an idea about God? How could someone become so afraid of God that they would end up in a mental institution or chronically fearful and depressed? Who represented God so negatively that an entire world is turned off? It has not been some force outside the church that has so destroyed the reputation of God. It has not been some evil demonic group. It has been the voices of well-meaning people within the church. Fear has been passed down from generation to generation in the church. From the earliest of times, the church has struggled with believing the truth about the finished work of Jesus. This failure to believe the truth has been the root of the fear. Anxiety and outright meanness of the church down through the ages. When Isaiah prophesied about the great work of the cross, he also prophesied in advance, Who has believed our report? There is a report about God that is so good, so freeing, so loving, so kind, so merciful and so generous that man refuses to believe it. Those who reject this wonderful report either spend a lifetime trying to please God or ultimately walk away from God. In my years of ministering on the streets, more people were angry at God because of the unbelieving report they heard in church than any other reason. Eugene H. Patterson says in his introduction to the book of Galatians, When men and women get their hands on religion, one of the first things they often do is to turn it into an instrument for controlling others, either putting or keeping them in their place. This seems to have become the goal of the church. Rather than setting people free with good news about Jesus, they use this as a way to bring people under their control. Early in Christian history, there arose those who would pervert the gospel. There were those who followed Paul around proclaiming, Believe in Jesus, he is the Messiah, he is the way of salvation, but the way of righteousness is the works of the law. This deceit in this message is so subtle. It is obvious that God has called us to live a righteous life. It is obvious that righteousness should be the fruit of being a Christian. So it would only seem logical to accept this message. However, what you believe about righteousness is what you really believe about relating to God. If keeping the law is our basis of righteousness, then it is the basis for receiving the promises of God. It is the basis of getting our prayers answered. It is the basis of God's protection. If keeping the law is the basis of righteousness, then our ability to have peace is determined by our ability to keep the law. 
Ultimately, keeping the law becomes our basis for salvation. While proclaiming belief in Jesus as the way of salvation in one breath, we have totally excluded Jesus in another breath. No one denies Jesus is Lord. In experience, however, we are looking to our performance to provide everything that Jesus died to provide. Intellectually and theologically, Jesus is still the centre of our faith, but emotionally and functionally, we have become the centre of our faith. Romans 8, 5-8 to in the message says it this way, Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action for them find that God's Spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite to focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God and ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing, and God isn't pleased at being ignored. This self-obsession is not the product of a person who desires to reject God. This is the person who is trying to please God by his own efforts. This is the person who has ignorantly rejected the finished work of Jesus and has become obsessed with earning righteousness by his performance, thus an obsession with self. Every letter that Paul wrote was aimed at bringing believers back to the finished work of Jesus. One by one, church by church, city after city, believers were seduced into returning to their own performance as their source of righteousness and ultimately their source of peace with God. They would just not believe the report about Jesus. In the book of Galatians, Paul points out the motivation of those who pervert the gospel control. A leader who doesn't trust Jesus doesn't believe the gospel will work by its own power. Because they themselves do not believe in the power of the gospel, they feel that it is their job to control you, to put you in your place. What makes this so undetectable is the motive. Many of the most destructive forces in the church are people with good motives. The most dangerous person is the one who has a deep passion to help people but does not believe in the power of the gospel to produce change. Instead of proclaiming the finished work of the Lord Jesus and entrusting the people to the work of the Holy Spirit, that person will resort to carnal methods of control. When people are controlled, it appears that they have changed. So the deep motive to help people justifies the desire to control. The main tool for control is fear. If you are not confident in your relationship with God, you will have fear. Fear will rob you of confidence. It will restrict you. It will make you angry. It will make you emotionally unstable. Fear will strip you of the new identity you have in Jesus. It will leave you stripped of the God-ordained dignity and worth that belongs to you as a priest and a king. It will make you feel the need for an intercessor. The intercessor that will come between you and God will not be the Lord Jesus. After all, you have rejected the peace he gives for the peace that someone else is offering. It will be a person. It will be someone who offers to show you the way, the formula. It will be someone who will know all the rules and requirements for staying right with God. You will be saved, but never secure. Your sin will be forgiven, but never forgotten. You will have the promises, but never the qualification to receive them. You will be given the family name, but never the family inheritance. You will forever strive to attain what Jesus has freely given. You will be given peace, but never be peaceful. This is not the plan of God for you. God desires for you to know and experience his great love, acceptance and peace. But you must believe the report that God gives about the finished work of Jesus. It is a good report. It is a report of peace.